All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for coming today. Good morning. Uh, my name is Matt Freeman. I'm the Director of Service Delivery for CBTS Hawaii, and I'd like to welcome everybody to a, another Hawaiian Telecom University event. Before we get started today, I wanted to review a few notes about today's event. First, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, but please feel free to submit any questions anytime during the, during the discussion. To submit a question, please click on that Q&A panel and type your question in the box. We'll also be doing some polls throughout the presentation, so please submit your answers to see how your cybersecurity posture stacks up with other businesses. And if we have some time, we'll review some of the poll contents at the end. Quick note about us, CBTS Hawaiian Telecom is a leading technology provider that delivers networking, security, cloud, infrastructure, communications, and consulting services to clients across North America and in Hawaii. CBTS launched the Hawaii location with Hawaiian Telecom in January of this year. The technical expertise of CBTS Hawaii, together with our local sales and support teams and our advanced technology solutions is a powerful combination. Our mission is to help local businesses implement innovative, transformative technologies that help drive desired outcomes. As some of you may know, October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and for the past several years, we've hosted events and published articles to drive awareness around cybersecurity, as it is a growing concern for every business here in Hawaii. Whether it's deterring security breaches, working through compliance rules, managing network access for remote workers, or maintaining compliance requirements, there's a lot to think about to ensure your business is taking the right steps. Hawaiian Telecom has been offering managed security services locally since 2010. Our security practice is focused on providing the hands-on support that local businesses need. Although we started off small, our ded dedicated security team has grown tremendously over the last few years, allowing us to expand the types of services we can offer. In addition to our partnerships with leading firewall and security vendors, we provide a managed SIM solution that helps your team see what is going on inside your network, allowing us to identify and respond to attacks. On top of protecting against attacks and monitoring security threats, we also provide compliance consulting services to help sort out the complex requirements of things like PCI and NIST. And finally, I'd like to briefly touch on our new security operations center, which is in the background here behind me. Our security team had outgrown our previous workspace here at the Alakea office, so we took advantage of the work from home requirements of the last six months to finish building out our dedicated SOC space. This new work area allows the analysts and engineers protecting our customer networks to move quickly through the stages of identification to mitigation. Once things get closer to normal and it's safe to do so, we'll open it up for small group tours so you can see our capabilities firsthand. And now, moving on to what everybody came here today for, I'd like to introduce Jordan Silva, a senior manager at CBTS Hawaiian Telecom. I've known Jordan professionally since 2008, and I'm very excited to have him running our SOC and NOC operations groups. Through his various IT roles, Jordan has worked with hundreds of Hawaii-based businesses to build and maintain exceptional IT programs. Jordan will be leading today's discussion with our guest speakers, Ryan Doy from Prince Resorts Hawaii and Dan Yoshioka from ABC Stores. Take it away, Jordan. Uh, thanks, Matt. Uh, and thanks for everybody for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we're pretty lucky in that we have two amazing guests. Uh, they're all stars really of the Hawaii IT community, so it should be a good time. Uh, first up, we have Ryan Doy. Um, many of you know probably know Ryan. He started his IT career uh, back in 1991 with the Department of Health, uh, but has spent the last 16 years with Prince Waikiki and Prince Resorts Hawaii. Uh, as the Corporate Director of Information Services, uh, he oversees the technology needs of three award-winning oceanfront resorts, three world-class golf courses, and of course the entities that go along with those. Ryan is also an active board member of the HLTA, HITC, and when he's not wrapping his brain around new systems and technologies, he's happiest experimenting with new recipes to feed his friends and family, or just out fishing with the boys. Uh, how are you doing today, Ryan? Doing good. Good morning, sir. Good morning. All right, and next up, we have Dane Yoshioka of ABC Stores. Dane has over 35 years of IT experience and is currently responsible for the data and voice networks, as well as numerous other systems the stores rely on every day. In addition to the standard installation and maintenance of these systems, Dane is also tasked with many PCI compliance roles, including remediating any vulnerabilities found, supporting penetration test activities, and participating in their annual PCI audit. Before joining ABC stores in 2000, he worked for Bank of Hawaii and Mobile Oil. How are you doing today, Dane? Good. 
Awesome. Let's see. I believe one of our polls should have popped up uh, and see if we got any results before we dive into the questions. Uh, maybe not. We'll just go ahead and proceed. So uh, I guess the first thing everybody's here to try to understand is what are some of the top concerns that are going on? I mean, in security right now, um, Dane, what's on your mind? I mean, what's keeping you kind of up at night and what's keeping you busy? I think data breaches are probably the biggest concern for us. You know, we've been trying to mitigate that as much as possible. And then it's malware coming into, you know, into the environment and, you know, the, the, the concern there is just, you know, user training and we just need to educate our users in, uh, being, uh, careful, you know, with email, cause that's how the phishing folks get in so uh, that's probably our biggest concerns right now for sure i think that's a pretty common one right now i mean it's it's pretty terrifying out there i mean every day every company i think is dealing with you know people trying to sneak in and do not so nice things on their networks uh, so it's definitely understandable uh ryan how about you yeah we as well um our my greatest concern is compromise or data breach of some kind um you know the attackers are getting a lot more uh, savvy and the attack from all different angles, um, you know, making sure we have the proper um, security in place, um, the proper monitoring, as well as the training for our staff, uh, help us to, you know, mitigate these, um, these attacks. But those by far are, you know, always on my mind, keeps me up. Um, and I don't think it'll ever go away, but it's just part of the game. <laughs> For sure. Um, you know, I think a lot of things have changed over the, I mean, the last couple of years. Uh, you guys have both been in this business for quite a while. Uh, has anything specific changed in the last few years or what's, what's new, I guess, or how have your roles changed? Uh, Ryan, why don't you start? In the last five years, I mean, we, we've seen an incredible increase of um, additional or new systems. It seems like every single department has one or two different systems that they need to be able to use. Uh, my job then would be to make sure that um, our data remains safe, um, accessibility to it uh, operationally is is still, you know, re reachable, but yet keep our network um, safe and secure. We've essentially tripled the number of systems that we have uh, in our environment than we had, you know, five, six years ago, um, which then comes into play. Monitoring is key. You know, I look upon monitoring of uh, all of our networks um, to make sure that, you know, the data that that we have remains safe and that any any kind of attacks we can, uh, you know, address right away. But um, that's been primarily my, you know, the, the changes that have come up uh, and the emphasis that we had to put on within the past five years. Definitely. I think that uh, everybody can agree that scope has definitely grown for all of us. Uh, looking at some of the poll answers, it seems like, yeah, managing data access, especially is one of the, the bigger concerns of the group. And I think that goes back to kind of what you're talking about with more systems, just trying to understand where data lives, who has access to it, who shouldn't have access to it, and kind of keeping that under control is a big concern. What about you, Dane? Yeah, you know, as we're trying to, you know, grow, you know, we need to automate in order to scale our operations. So it's requiring us to, uh, we went quite pretty hard in wireless environment. So we have handhelds in every store and the handhelds are getting more and more important to our operation. You know, we're using it for ordering. We the stores are using it to scan items to see the movement. So they're not having to be um, tethered to their PC to see the uh, activities within the store. So the, the challenge for us is as we automate is controlling the access, especially once it hits the internet. You know, we're, um, our compliance requirements with PCI have you know, give us the guidelines on what we need to do to uh, secure our uh, our credit card 
data, we just expanded that throughout our whole enterprise and we use it to control. We, we use that as the baseline to control apps and only give the appropriate access where it's needed. The challenge with that is, you know, as we expand and the uh, devices become more prevalent amongst more users, then, you know, the, we need to, you know, modify the access for the individual groups to give them the appropriate uh, access to the data. They and definitely see how that'd be a challenge. So um, you mentioned PCI. For those who don't know, uh, PCI compliance, compliance is our payment card industry compliance. Uh, anybody who kind of processes credit cards or takes payments generally falls into some level of PCI compliant framework that they need to follow. Um, both of your organizations as a, a hotel and also a chain of stores obviously fall into this category. Um, what are some of the bigger challenges with PCI compliance that you've had to sort of you know, approach over the last few years? All right. Oh, for uh, PCI compliance has always been, you know, on our minds back, uh, you know, 10, 11 years ago um, when it, it it became a a subject or became a compliance issue. Um, every year it seems to increase as far as the requirements, um, you know, the sensitivity, uh, certainly keeping credit cards, um, credit card data safe is first and foremost on our on our minds as well as for our for our guests um biggest challenges that we're dealing with now is you know with the the chip and pin um all the the touchless type of uh, technologies apple pay and and so forth um has been a challenge as well as segmenting our networks uh to make sure that our pci data remains uh secure that along with the new, you know, with GDPR, the California uh, Privacy Act, um, combined with the PCI compliance, uh, all makes, you know, that they, they all hand in hand, but uh, it becomes a challenge for us to manage and maintain uh, to make sure that we are compliant uh, year over year. Absolutely. Uh, looking at the poll, it looks like about 40% of the people uh, attending have to deal with PCI uh, or some other form of compliance. Um, Dane, you work for a fairly large organization with lots of locations. What kind of things have you had to sort of tackle to meet these challenges? Well, for us, we're a tier two organization. So that requires us to have an on-site audit every year. So the, the challenge for us is, you know, dealing with the auditor and uh, fortunately, we've had the same auditor for probably the last four or five years. So he's gotten used to our uh, process. Uh, the main thing for us with PCI is it gives us that guideline on how we need to secure our, our credit card information. And that caused us to redo how we process credit cards in terms of the uh, transport of the credit card data throughout our, our network. Um, the, the compliance, the, the online audit is a little challenging for us. Um, the, the big thing from the network standpoint is you need your drawing. You need that network drawing that shows the auditor what portions of your network are in scope for PCI and what's out of scope for PCI. Because they'll just focus on your in scope environment and look at everything you have. You know, they they have you log into your devices showing that you have two factor authentication. Um, they they make sure all your your time uh, stamps are correct. So they're looking at your NTP, making sure that's all running. Uh, they they look they get screenshots. It's it's pretty daunting. Um, a big part of that is logging because they need to know that we're monitoring our network. So we're using you know CBTS's managed services to monitor our network. So they're involved in our PCI audit. So we have a portion where they participate. And before. Uh, this whole pandemic, they were coming onto our site to meet with our auditor. 
And because of the pandemic, this this year's audit was virtual, so we did everything remotely. And you know, uh, managed services had to get on a you know a WebEx with our auditor to demonstrate how they're monitoring our network. And it goes all the way to change management, uh, trouble tickets. You know, they want to see everything that we're doing to manage our environment. Absolutely, yeah. And you, you both mentioned a couple of key parts of compliance there, and I think it's important for everybody to understand that scope really matters. Um, you know, the answer to both the, the first few questions really has to do with where data lives and where things are sort of growing. And that's a big part of any any compliance framework is understanding where sensitive data exists and how to manage that. So I think you're spot on, right? Having a network diagram or something that you can show visually and really explain where the data is supposed to be versus where it is and who can access that data and how uh, making sure you have things like that in line really, really helps auditors out. So it's very clear on what areas are impacted by the audit and by the compliance as a whole. Um, you know, 2020 has been kind of a chaotic year uh, for lots of reasons, and it hasn't made compliance much easier because when we start talking about scope, we also have to start talking about things like remote workers and how are people accessing your network? And that definitely came up as a concern in one of the earlier polls. Uh, how has 2020 impacted your business and how are you dealing with some of that stuff? Uh, Dana, uh, for, for, for us, we went out and made a pretty large purchase of laptops. Uh, we, we don't allow personal devices into our environment just because we can't control it. So we only issue laptops to users that need remote access. So uh, we were feverishly bringing laptops and they were hard to find because a lot of people were buying laptops. So we, we bought from two different sources and we got them imaged, prepped and issued out to the users that need to be remote. Now, all our remote access is dual factor authentication. So we had to make sure we had enough licenses for our dual factor. And so, you know, we had to wrap up pretty quickly because, um, you know, the pandemic caused us as an organization to, our concept was we created two teams within each department. And for some departments, the teams alternated weeks coming into the office and their off weeks were remote working other uh, groups, both uh, groups came in. We had to give physical separation of those groups. So in our back office, we have three facilities that we, that we have that we were moving people around to separate our department. So it just became a big challenge in uh, getting people moved to a different location uh, it really messed up our network segmentation because um, uh, we had a lot of challenges with that, giving people the access they needed. But, you know, so those were the, you know, the big things that happened in 2020. And uh, once this thing starts to slow down, then, then you'll see departments move back. So we'll have that you know, back in you know, activity to do. Yeah, I think that brings up some interesting challenges, right? Like a lot of people think that remote access was the only kind of impact, but when you start talking about the need for social distancing, and I know we went through the same thing here where we're moving people to different parts of the buildings when we're when they're allowed here and making sure that they still have access to the portions of the network they need, even though their physical location has now changed. Um, Ryan, what about you? You have people working out of state already and things like, I mean, resorts on different islands. How has remote access kind of impacted you or what changes have you had to make? Well, we had to make uh, changes right away. Uh, it was very quick. Uh, fortunately, we a large number of our users, our salespeople, our execs, whatnot, they already had laptops with VPN access, of course, with multi-factor authentication. Uh, but there are a number of other users that did not have that access before. And like Dane had mentioned, there's no way, you know, we're not going to allow personal computers to VPN onto our network, not having that kind of control or assurance that their computer is up to par and safe. What we were able to do very quickly because of the, you know, the, the software that we use to manage our network is to provide these users 
access for remote access into their work computer on site. Uh, that worked very well. Um, it still promoted, you know, it's still access through multi factor. Um, but yet their personal computer itself is not, you know, connected to the network. They're simply um, working with their own desktop, which they're used to used to uh, doing. Our biggest challenge was then, you know, speed of their access from their home network, especially as their kids are doing remote learning and, um, you know, that that became a challenge. Uh, getting the credentials to people, um, making sure that, you know, they're able to access um, their work computer. Once they were able to get in, um, then they were fine. So the learning curve was very minimal. Um, we had all the the security uh, in place because they're merely accessing, you know, the data um, that they had should if they were sitting within their office. So it it wasn't that bad. We made some changes to our voice uh, voicemail system so that they could, you know, get their voicemail, um, you know, sent to their email, as opposed to having to call in, you know, periodically just to check on it. So operationally, we it seem seemingly we didn't skip a beat. You know, there are a number of people that needed to be, you know, furloughed off, added, disconnected, or whatnot, but. You know, I felt pretty good about the way that we approached it and the speed of which we could get um, them access without jeopardizing the, you know, the network security. Yeah, I think that uh, speaks a lot towards both of your preparation for a lot of this stuff. You know, um, it's it's easy to kind of run into walls with with big changes like this. With I mean, it was a cultural shift. It wasn't just a you know a one day there's a hurricane we have to take a couple days off kind of change. This was a drastic. Hey, we're in it kind of for a while. Let's let's prepare. So. It sounds like you both made it through that really well. So, I mean, congratulations on that. That's it's important and speaks, I mean, highly to both of your preparation. Um, you both mentioned, you know, laptops and working from home more and VPNing and things like that. I think mobile devices are going to be just forever more popular after after this. Uh, how are you guys dealing with mobile device management, or what is some of the impact you've seen of more people using smartphones and devices and wanting access to the network from wherever they are? I mean, uh, how are you handling that kind of stuff, Dane? Well, uh, for our execs, they like to use their phone, you know, and, and mainly it's email. That's really what they're, they, they want to be in touch with. And our email is outsourced. So it's, it's in the internet. So we've, we created an internet only subnet in our wireless network so that it can only get to the internet. It can't touch anything, any resources on the inside. So that was enough for our execs. You know, and we really can limit it to the execs. We're not allowing any other uh, uh, associates to use their personal devices on our network. So we're, you know, we're hoping to be able to control that, you know, um, and, you know, we, we just need executive support to, to do that. And so far, they, they understand the security issues that we're faced with and, it's a balance for them because they're looking at, you know, company efficiency and, you know, we're trying to preach the security aspect of it. So it's a challenge for them and it's a constant education for us to educate them on what the risks are so that they can make a business decision for, for us. And it's been going pretty well. I think you, you really hit it on the head there, right? Where you're talking about there's, there's always going to be this balance between wanting things to be ultra secure and, you know, protected, but also very functional for the people who need to use it. And at the end of the day, it's a business. So making that correct business decision on how much effort is, are we going to put into protecting things and how much restriction can we kind of tolerate? I think those are important topics and you're exactly right. It, it's a very much a executive decision that has to occur and you need buy-in and um, going down that road is important. Uh, Ryan, how about you? Uh, how's, how's your team handled that? Or, um, for Prince Resorts Away, we only allow managers to have email on their on their uh, cellular devices. Um, we have several uh, cell phones that the company owns, primarily for use with our housekeepers, uh, engineering staff, and and whatnot. For that, we we do use an MDM. We have everything locked down so that the application so it, it's only used for the application that they have. We're looking at you know 
various other methods or or MDM products that we could use potentially for our you know executive team for the emails being able to you know containerize uh, is important to me. Um, so that's one thing that that we're looking at uh, implementing. We don't have that yet, but it's soon to come you know down the pike because we need to be able to preserve and protect all of our data while the while the uh, staff is with us and when they terminate. Um, so that's okay. yeah. I think uh, you're mentioning mobile device management software is what you're sort of talking about. So for a lot of these mobile devices, there's a bunch of vendors who make tools that can, uh, like I said, build a container almost on the remote device so you can control the data that's within it and uh, sort of protect the rest of your network and isolate your corporate data from the rest of somebody's personal data, even on the same device. Right. Awesome. Um, so I think, uh, Dane, you mentioned this, but with that balance we were kind of talking about, uh, what kind of, I don't know, steps have you taken to sort of educate your staff and help them understand why the security portion is important? Or how do you get them to sort of come to the secure side of, of that utilization balance? Is there anything, any tips you can provide on getting encouraging people to do that kind of stuff? Or I mean, what are your thoughts on that? You know, we, we've gotten, you know, some, you know, users to kind of be very cautious on emails coming in. And we had a big scare uh, a while back where, you know, these hackers, they're able to change the uh, ID of the email, where the email is coming from. So it, it appeared that it came in from someone within our organization. And we were really close of taking, uh, you know, our associate took, almost took the action. And, and uh, luckily their manager caught it and uh, it kind of caused us to do this big broadcast to our user community to really scrutinize email. And so now what we're seeing is we're seeing uh, our associates who get suspicious emails, sending it into our email support. Uh, we have an email support uh, hotline basically. So they forward those emails into that group and that group makes the uh, assessment and then it's broadcast to all our users on this is what's coming in. So I think users are slowly getting a little more cautious when they get emails and really scrutinizing and it's it's getting better, but you know, we still get malware alerts coming in from managed services. So, you know, it's not hundred percent, but it's it's not too bad. Yeah, every little bit helps, right? And I think uh, once you get to the point where your staff are being diligent and seeing that kind of stuff, and they don't have to, I mean, they just have to know enough to ask, right? So if you got to that point, I think you're, you're on track for sure. Uh, Ryan, how about you? I mean, it's it's not always easy to encourage people to take the secure route because it usually means, you know, a few more clicks. It means entering a two-factor token. It means, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. How do you go about getting your staff on board with things like that? Well, a lot of it is training, 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 um, you know, especially as it relates to phishing attacks, um, social engineering, or just cybersecurity in general. Um, we've adopted a comprehensive training program. I mean, since for a couple of years now that we that we continually train or test our users on a you know quarterly basis by sending out test emails. Um, seeing who catches them in, you know, creating multiple trainings based on who, um, who fell for it or not. Um, I get reports on that and just additional training, talking to the users, having, um, you know, one on ones as well as with, with the, with the managers, letting, making them aware of what could be, you know, um, the result of a bad click. One way or another, but we've made it very easy for them to report any of the um, any kind of you know unknown or or questionable emails, you know that we review and um, to make sure that it's it either is valid or not. And we find that our count has gone down considerably. Everyone is now very aware. They don't want to go through additional training if they don't have to. So they're very cautious about any about you know all 
emails that may come in that might look uh, suspicious. But even with that, you know, I mean, you, you still, that's just one, one layer. We have, you know, we've implemented, you know, several perimeter type um, um, protection, like, you know, Cisco's umbrella, um, you know, various filtering, you know, email filtering, um, and, you know, the managed services, uh, you know, notification on things that might be going on in the network. A lot of times they're false positives, but I'd like to see those because we know that, you know, the monitoring is working for one and that, uh, you know, something that we can investigate further. But that would be, you know, definitely things that should be done in an environment. For sure. I think uh, both of you are hitting on training pretty heavily and that's that's important, right? It's security is a cultural thing more than anything else. I mean, people have to understand that it's, you know, everybody's responsibility to keep data safe. And at the end of the day, I think the, the understanding the why of security is really important. I mean, you're both in customer service organizations, hospitality, you're dealing with personal data for, you know, your customers and we're protecting that stuff. Uh, I think as long as everybody understands that that's the goal, it, it's pretty easy to sort of comply with. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Um, we have a couple of questions coming in. So real quick before we start diving into those, um, do you have any just pieces of advice you'd give to any other local IT leaders or people kind of coming up in the IT space that are just trying to tackle security problems? Uh, Brian, why don't you start? I would say, I mean, the technology has grown. I mean, there's so many facets of it, especially as it relates to cybersecurity. Not all companies have the ability to hire the expertise that that's required in order to maintain a secure and you know proper network. My biggest recommendation would be to not get bogged down in the sense of hiring all these staff. We're trying to figure out who's going to learn this within your staff. Hire a you know. Get along with uh, CBTS and managed services so that we can, so they can be an extension of your of your team. That's how I view it. That's how it's always been. And um, you know, I, I I can't say enough about the support that that we get, um, knowing that I have numbers that I can call. They're looking out for my best interests. They know what's going on in my network because they not only are they managing the security portion, but also the network, the routing, the switching. Um, that has helped me to not have to, you know, hire high grade technical support in an industry that, you know, we're not able to to provide or to hire that type of uh, expertise. So it helps. It helps me, helps my company to be, you know, state of the art and to do the right things, um, you know, in the company and keep safe. Absolutely. How about you, Dane? What advice would you give to people out there? Yeah, uh, I agree with uh, Ryan there. You need to find a technology partner. It, it's it's literally impossible to create that, that expertise yourself. You would have a especially in Hawaii, you know, technical resources are hard to find. And if you find them, they're hard to keep. So if you get a technology partner, they have the expertise uh, where they can tailor your inter your enterprise on how you need it. And what you need to do, what, you know, what I found I needed to do was really understand our business needs. And once you know that and can communicate that to your technology partner, your enterprise will get very tailored to your operation. And so focus on your business needs, partner up with a technology um, partner. And we did that with CBTS and managed services and communicate with them on what you need and they can deliver. And it's, it's the only way to go. You, there's no way you can do it yourself. Awesome. All right. Uh, I think I can agree with all of that. Um, let's start jumping into some of these questions. There's a few out there. Uh, I think Matt will go to you for the first one. Um, what is the most critical step to take after a data breach? Well, that's a, a great question. And unfortunately, the most critical steps you can take are before the data breach. Um, so you really need to be prepared for when that happens. Um, otherwise, you're going to have a, a worse day. 
um, than you would otherwise. So really what you're looking to do before a data breach is make sure you've developed an incident response plan so that your team knows what to do when, when this bad day occurs. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you have logging in place ahead of time and that you know exactly where to look and, and who to call. Once you have an incident, whether it's um, whether it's malware, whether it's ransomware, whether it's a, a data leak, um, you're going to want to try and lock down as much of that um, environment as possible so that you can really determine what the scope is. Um, once you can understand the scope of what's been breached, then you can move into figuring out how it happened, patching that up, and then mitigating that from there. But the, the first thing you want to do after the breach is um, refer to your incident response plan that you hopefully have already prepared, and then start locking down the environment to determine what the scope is of that breach so that you can respond appropriately. Awesome. Uh, and I know Dane and Ryan, both of you have prepared incident response plans because that's part of PCI. I'm sure you've worked extensively on those. Uh, I've seen some of them, so they're they're definitely worth yeah. the effort, right? <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, yeah awesome. and, and what we do is uh, we have managed services do an annual exercise with us to go through our uh, our incident response plan, and we bring in all the execs all the way to our president. Matt's been at many of them, and, and he's seen all our execs. And you know, they they give us uh, case scenarios, and we we talk through it. You know, and everyone in our organization hears it, and we get a lot of questions, especially from our uh, public relations manager, because you know he's always concerned on you know how do we, you know, at what point do we notify the public that we've had an incident? So the exercise is really key, and, and we do it annually, so it's you know, it's a great service we get out of managed services. Yeah, I think it's really important not only to have the plan, but to practice it, right? Make sure everybody is aware. And and like you mentioned, it's not just a technical uh, response. There's there's lots of pieces to that. I mean, if you're in an organization uh, that is compliant, like PCI or HIPAA, there are notification guidelines. So if you have a like a public relations person or some type of media uh, relations person, they need to be involved in things like that. Um, it, it's part of the law. Uh, let's see. One of the other questions that came in was, how do you stop a tech savvy or a tech savvy person from VPNing in on their personal computer? Um, I can answer that one a little bit. You can use hardware certificates and restrict based on the device itself. So only authorized devices can actually connect. Um, VPNs can authenticate in a couple of different ways. You can use usernames and passwords, which is very common. Uh, but in addition to that, you can have a second factor, like a certificate that's loaded and locked to the device itself. So you can just restrict devices as a whole. Um, Ryan, I know you use VPN a lot. Are, are you, I mean, what do you think about this? Do you have trouble with people VPNing in on devices that maybe you don't want? Or have you had to deal with that in the past? Uh, we've had to deal with that in the past. But uh, with the new um, firewall and endpoint protection and client that we have, um, it's customized. so. There are, they'll need to be able to get access to that in install file in order to load it onto their personal computer. But so since then, we haven't had any problems at all of anyone trying uh, to get in. It, it, it's become more cumbersome, but a lot more secure, I, I think, for us. Yeah, and a lot of it is also probably just training people, right? I think I don't think anybody wants to intentionally make the environment less secure. So as long as you can educate people as to why you're mm -hmm. doing stuff. Uh, I think a lot of people will generally try their best to comply. And as long as your controls are within, you know, the tolerance of what you're trying to secure and people understand that. Right. Uh, what else do we have? Um, with people working from home, there's an increase in collaboration with cloud-based software. Uh, is there risk involved with the increase of cloud storage? And how does that impact sensitive information? Um, do either of you use cloud-based uh, storage solutions currently? Uh, we don't. Yeah. We we use um, some SaaS applications, but it does not uh, include, you know, sensitive storage. You know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, if anything, we we use it for our, you know, backup for disaster recovery. But yeah. Sure. And I think that's pretty common. Um. There are risks involved, but a lot of it isn't more significant than on-site storage, I'd say. Uh, you want to make sure you're working with trusted vendors who go through their own compliance audits and have that data available to you, obviously, to mitigate some of that risk because you're trusting someone with the storage. Um, but I think that as a whole, 
you need to be aware of the same things. Access control is always going to be an issue. I think it's very easy to accidentally give people more access in cloud-based solutions. Um, so you need to be aware of how access is given and how it can be shared. A lot of cloud-based uh, tools have the ability to share data very easily, and that's why they exist. But you want to be weary of who's sharing data and who has the ability to share out some of that data. Uh, but other than that, it's it's very similar as long as you're working with a trusted partner, and that that's important. Um, let's see, we have another one. We are strong with security operations, but need help with organization policies. Cart before the horse is HT a resource for that, or do you have a strong partner that can be shared, um, Matt? Yeah, let me take that one. Um, so great question. Um, we do. Uh, offer a wide variety of security services, in, including security consulting services. Uh, we have helped multiple customers in the past with um, either improving or updating their corporate policies related to InfoSec. And in some cases, we've helped build them from scratch. So that is a service that we could offer. Um, we can also help with comparisons of your current posture and policy towards some of the common compliance requirements. If you're in the, if you're industry is is PCI DSS required or if you need to compare to NIST we can help with that if you're not really sure where to get started we would probably recommend the CIS top 20 as a good baselining we can help with baselining against some of the the major compliance rule sets or frameworks and then help you develop or en enhance your policy from there so um, you know I would encourage you to reach out to your uh, CBTS wine telecom account manager and just have a conversation about what you might be interested in or what some gaps might be and they'll probably pull somebody like me or or Jordan or some of our solutions architects in to really help you um, take advantage of that conversation so Let's see, that's a good lead into one of these other questions, which is what recommendations can you make for a small business or a new business with a limited budget who wants to start off on the right foot with their security posture? Where should they focus their dollars? Um, I'd say you want to start with an assessment like Matt is mentioning. Uh, security is about mitigating risk. So you have to identify what your risks are. And part of risk is understanding where the most valuable assets on your network are and, and why they exist and frankly what they're worth. Uh, so you want to get a good understanding of that. You'll also need to understand what legal requirements you have. When we start talking about things like NIST or HIPAA or PCI, um, there's legal obligations associated with those. So you generally need to take care of those first um, because they're required. Uh, Dane, what about uh, what are your thoughts on that? Where did you guys get started when you needed to, you know, tackle this to begin with? Uh, what we decided to do was to expand our relationship that we had with CBTS. You know, we, we were using them strictly as a facilities provider and we uh, became cognizant that we, weren't, we were losing some of our technical people and we just needed help. So we just engaged with managed services and the relationship has just expanded from there, and uh, I feel very confident, you know, in our our posture, you know, in terms of you know, where we stand and our ability to react to situations. You know, the it it makes a big difference when you have someone watching your network twenty four seven. It's it's very uh, it's it's a good feeling to have. So you need to start there, you know, with um, a partner, and, and uh, that's our recommendation for that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of value in that, right? Like you mentioned earlier, you know, the role of IT teams internally is to truly understand your business, and working with partners and things along those lines can help really match up a good technical solution to the business that you're an expert in. So. I think that's a good start for a lot of people. Um, Ryan, how did you get started? I, I mean, you've been on this, I mean, security journey for a while now with Prince Resorts. Uh, where did you guys start or how do you, where do you recommend people begin? Well, like, like Dane had mentioned, I mean, we, we built a relationship with C CBTS with different things, um, whether it be the managed services on the switching and, and routing gear. Um, and then the discussion, you know, being a partner and being comfortable, um, led us into other products or other services that we took advantage of. Um, I would say my recommendation would be to spend the money with the start off with the uh, consulting <clears throat> to know where you're at and to 
to identify your needs and then prioritize. <clears throat> that's <clears throat> that's pretty much what we did. Um, and we when we went along, when the requirements became more and more stringent, we needed to add on more services. Uh, it just was a natural fit because all the pieces then fit together on you know the different aspects of the network, the different aspects of cybersecurity in itself. Um, that's how we ended up to where we are today, which uh, I am very comfortable with, and, you know, and and an advocate for as well, very strongly. Absolutely. Let's see. There's a couple questions regarding specific applications and what we recommend. Um, I'm gonna shy away from some of those questions, mostly because the answer to all of them is gonna be it depends. Um, you know, as similar as computer networks can be, I don't think this would be the best venue to you know, talk about a specific application. So if you have questions about specific applications or something along those lines, reach out to us and we can kind of talk to you about your business and what your network looks like. It's just gonna vary a lot based on scale and based on what you currently have in place. So uh, for those who re are reaching out asking for specific application names or recommendations, um, shoot us an email, uh, htuniversity at hawaiintel.com or reach out to your account manager and we can definitely help you select some applications that'll meet these needs, but we wanna make sure we're giving you good advice. So without uh, going, you know, diving into your network a little, it, it wouldn't be probably wise of us to uh, recommend anything right now. Uh, there were, uh, there was another question about, you know, pros and cons between switching to the cloud or using a VPN and probably just other remote access methods. Um, with staff coming in and out of the offices and some businesses even looking at going long-term remote, how did you choose which remote access tool to use and what sort of led you to where you are currently? Uh, Ryan, you mentioned you're using VPN a lot, uh, but you also have remote access to individual desktops. What kind of draws you to each one or what are some of the benefits you've seen of using a VPN, for example? Well, b benefits being we have control over that their workstation, they take the workstation with them back and forth um, remotely as well as on the network. So VPN was a natural fit for that. Um, we use the remote access for for users that don't have a company supplied uh, device. It's not the the best solution, I I think, but it does work well, especially for on prem type um, applications that don't work so well over VPN. Um, I am considering, you know, uh, cloud. Uh, many of the applications, many of the systems that we've had uh, hosted on-prem are now in the cloud. So many things are going outside, making it a little bit easier, I guess, to manage from a network standpoint. But knowing that remote um, remote work is a real reality that's gonna stay around for, for a while, I think, um, having the ability to access these, uh, these applications um, remotely, I think is, is key. So, Having a cloud versus VPN, um, there's some pros. There's definitely pros and cons. There's cost savings on each in in each regard, but um, security is always going to be you know a concern that that needs to be considered when when selecting. So, as Jordan mentioned, I guess it depends on your operation and um, what needs to be accessed and who needs that that access and what kind of controls you need to have around them. All right, I think that makes sense. And Dane, you mentioned uh, that within your organization, you're you're heavily limiting a lot of that to just online email-based applications uh, for now. And I think that that kind of fits in with what we were talking about. It It's one of those answers that it just kind of depends. You have to look at what applications you have that you need available. You need to look at what type of data people are trying to access and how they're accessing it, the sensitivity of that data. Um, so it's unfortunately not as easy as just a quick pros cons list, but we can definitely, sit with you and talk with you about it if you have more questions about that and kind of understand what your situation is and provide some recommendations if you reach out. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, how do you give users or how do you keep users interested in learning things about security without having them feel overwhelmed or bored? Um, Matt, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, well, you might need to balance that between you have to train them and you want to make it fun, right? And, and a lot of the, the annual compliance requirements, you, you have to do some type of training. 
Um, it doesn't mean it has to be a long, lengthy textbook style training. Um, for example, you know, every October, um, Hawaiian Telecom, CBTS, we use a uh, computer based training module to get across the importance of protecting customer data, you know, the fundamentals of PCI and how to how to preserve that. That's about a, a 15 to 20 minute module. It's interactive. It has little pop quizzes and silly voices and animation. So that makes it a little bit more fun that, you know, for, for larger organizations that make sure that people know what they need to know. Um, you can also do tabletop exercises. Dane mentioned that, you know, that's something that we regularly do with ABC stores. Um, those that's more interactive where we'll present a scenario and we'll say, what do you do? And then, well, what if that doesn't work? And then who do you call? And so it really makes you kind of um, analyze the security situation from a training perspective um, in a little bit more fun way. There's, there's lots of free web uh, resources on YouTube to, to do um, short, um, video content training, that's some things that you can look at, but I think look at why you're training people um, and then focus it on that so that you meet the, you have to train them on things they need to know and then worry about, you know, making it um, a little bit more fun. Yeah, I think I'll add to that. Just really focus on the why, like Matt mentioned, if people understand why they're supposed to be doing something and the importance of it, um, they're probably more inclined to do it. I think that that's the, the hardest part. Just tell them, hey, do this because it's your job. It's a little rougher, but if you can get them on board with, you know, they're securing important information, they're protecting people, um, and they really are. I think it, it goes over a little more smoothly. Uh, all right, uh, I think we're out of time. Um, thank you, Ryan and Dane, uh, and thank you for everybody else who joined us. Uh, if you have any questions that we weren't able to answer, I know there's a few in there that we didn't get to, please reach out to your account manager or email us at htuniversity at hawaiiantel.com, and we'll have somebody get back to you for sure. Um, there will be a survey that pops up as you exit out of the WebEx event. Please take that. Uh, your feedback is really important to us. We want to make these events useful for you and for everybody else. So if you can give us some information on how you felt about things, it'd be, I mean, we'd, we'd be happy to have it. Uh, and we'll also be sending out a video recording of the event and some additional security tips. So be on the lookout and have a great day, everyone. Appreciate you tuning in. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.